Good, uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, most of you, I imagine, are uh, joining us in, uh, in South Africa. If you're not, and you're joining us from around the world, uh, whatever time it is where you're at, welcome to the Skibs Flash Forum. It is a huge uh, uh, honor to be hosting you. Uh, I'm your MC, so I'm just going to be doing a few introductions. I, my name is Ant Wilson Prangley. I work at, uh, at, at Gibbs. I'm a member of the faculty with a deep passion for uh, inclusion, uh, for belonging, for high performance. And those are some of the um, themes that we're going to be talking about this afternoon. And um, what a great uh, a team we've got here with JP uh, Dumini and Owen Eastwood. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce them. I'll start, uh, I'll start with Owen. Um, Owen is a high performance coach and has worked uh, with the South African Protea team, um, as well as uh, recently with Gareth Southgate's English team. And so he's been and continues to work at the, at the very highest levels. Uh, he's also worked with NATO. He's worked with ballet, high performance ballet groups, and uh, as well as corporate leaders. And so has a, has a wealth of experience about performance, um, mainly on the sports field, but also in, in business. So I think, uh, Owen, it was lovely in my preparation reading your story and, uh, and your background and of your uh, letter that you wrote to uh, the Maori tribe that uh, I think your father had been half, a, half, at least genetically half part of and, and, um, and, and felt this feeling of belonging and, and connectedness, which inspires so much of your work. And so thank you very much for joining us uh, at Gibbs and with our, our audience and our participants out there to share this fasc fascinating book Belonging, the ancient art of togetherness. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Of course, you'll be hosted by a South African Jim and uh, somebody that uh, we'll all know and uh, who has uh, entertained us uh, with his athletic fielding, uh, with his brilliant left-handed batting. And of course, um, with uh, what Wikipedia called JP, your uh, useful occasional bowling or, or something that, to those things, which I thought was a little bit harsh. Um, a useful change bowler, that's what they, they, they mentioned. Oh, right. uh, and I thought that was a little bit harsh for somebody who uh, got a, a hat compliment. trick up and uh, took plenty of wickets. Uh, but yes, mostly known for uh, your, your, your batting. And of course, me as a, as a cricket fan, um, and I'm sure many of you too will, will never forget that uh, 2008, uh, you know, Australian uh, series uh, where you and uh, Dale Stain uh, put on 180 and and broke the rec long-standing record of uh, the Pollock brothers. Um, uh, and as we took our first series victory over Australia, they never lost in 16 years. Um, and so there were many great moments. And so it's always an honour to uh, connect with you, JP. And uh, thank you very much for being the host and for uh, interviewing. Uh, Owen, and so I'm going to hand over to the two of you, and uh, firstly to JP, and I imagine you'll then kick things off, JP. Uh, yep. Thanks very much. If you can post questions in the chat, and uh, we're going to be running from 4 to 5 p.m. South African time, and uh, JP will hand back to me a little bit later. But over to you, JP. Thanks, Ant. Uh, thanks, JD. Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that Owen uh, feels the exact same way that this is a huge privilege and not only the privilege to be speaking to you all, but to particularly speak about a topic that I think is very, very close to both of our hearts. So uh, I, I dive straight in and, and by starting, uh, just talking a little bit about, about Owen and, and myself's uh, relationship where it goes back to what 11 years now where I met you for the first time, Owen, and uh, was uh, for those that have read his book, you would have seen parts of it. We speaks about um, our very first culture camp. And that was the very first time that I met him. And from there already, uh, we had this unique connection around culture and just the, the coming togetherness of, of people. So I'm certainly excited for this conversation. Uh, and, and I think about this, this book belonging, Owen, and I would love for you to share with our audience the real purpose for you behind uh, writing this book. Hi, JP. Love you, my brother. And um, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to spending an hour with you as well as the whole audience. Uh, my motivation, I'm interested in your view on this as well, is that you know, if you're lucky enough, privileged enough like you to get into an elite high-performance environment, 
often you get exposed to some quite inspirational uh, enlightened leadership you know you have a, you're surrounded by high standards um, you've got a real sense of purpose about what you're doing You've got real motivation, which is shared by the people around you. And it's just a great environment to be in. It's, it's sort of uh, unique. And the thing that I didn't feel comfortable about actually reflecting on this a couple of years ago was I come from a very humble family. I was, I was brought up by a, a solo mother with four of us children. I wasn't an elite sports person like you were. And, you know, I sort of got into performance coaching a little bit by accident. But what I didn't really like was that, you know, why do you have to be an elite sports person or talent in order to get exposed to inspirational environments? Um, I've never been comfortable with that. Why aren't these, why aren't the same practices, the, the, the same focus on culture and the same enlightened leadership available to everybody? Whether you're at school, whether you're in the classroom, whether you're in a, any sports team, whether you're in a workplace. So a big part of my motivation for writing the book was I want these ideas that you've enjoyed and have brought the best out of you to be shared by anybody in any um, environment they happen to be in. And in terms of, of, of the response of the book, have you been pretty overwhelmed by it? Uh, well, it's been very strange. Obviously, the last thing I'd call myself as an author, I mean, this is the first and probably only book I'll write, but um, it, 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 yeah, um, I think it went, to, it went to number one in New Zealand in its first week, and then it hit number one in Amazon over here during the Euros, obviously booked a lot of profile as the England football team made its way to the final. So I don't know how much that is um, just promotion versus people having, you know, absorbed the book because it's only been out for two months um, around the world. So, yeah, it's had amazing reaction so far. But I think actually it'd be better to judge that in a year or two and see how sustainable it is and, and whether people um, are you, uh, finding the book useful. Yeah. You know, just diving a little bit deeper into this, the concept of, of culture. Uh, the way I've certainly come to understand it is a way of thinking that transcends into consistent behaviors. And we've certainly had many conversations over a span of a decade about how culture never stands still. And it's always evolving. It's every day there's a shift. And I think about the uh, audience today, and I think about there being a probably a more business focus as opposed to a sporting environment necessarily. Would you say that uh, the balance between promoting uh, the well-being of people and having this idea of having to fulfill targets and goals, do you think they they closely align? Yeah, well, that's an awesome question. Um, first of all, let, let's actually spend a bit of time defining what culture is. Because people can um, easily get lost and bored quickly if, if, if we don't do that. My starting point always has been this insight from the English Institute of Sports uh, meta study they did, which is 70% of human behavior is determined by whatever environment you are, you are in. Okay, So 70% of your behavior will be basically determined by whatever environment you're in. So you and I are behaving in a certain way in this context. If you and I were to then meet up in person this evening and go to a pub, there'll be at least a 70% shift. If you and I then have to present to a board tomorrow morning, there'll be another 70% shift. We're very malleable and adaptable to our environment. So culture is a really clear definition of what is our environment that we're in right now. And what are the standards? What's the sense of trust around us? Do we have a shared identity? Do we know actually what we're trying to achieve together? All of those things together create the environment. That's the first point. Second point, you know, I hope people now start to get this, that performance and well-being are interwoven together. And it is crazy that for so many years, there's been this idea that we need to really, really be harsh, hard on people physically, mentally, in order to get the best performance from them. And I've worked in some sports, gymnastics and ballet, where the idea is you are very, very tough. It's a tough, unpleasant experience, a lot of it, in order to find out those who can handle it. But what happens along the way is some absolute amazing talent gets lost because they don't have that resilience at that particular age. 
So I think that's all nonsense. And I think really what we should be doing is promoting well-being, let all the talent have an opportunity to shine. And then when we get to the point of having to pick a team to go to the Olympics or whatever, then we do the selection at that point rather than trying to filter people out by having a, you know, a what I would say harmful environment on the way. So look, I don't know about you, I'm pretty confident about this, that you and I probably perform at our best when we're feeling really well about ourselves. Mm. Physic not just physically, emotionally, spiritually, if we're feeling good about ourselves, we feel well, we'll, we'll perform better. It's pretty freaking yeah, obvious, yeah. but it has got lost along the way. And, and it's such an interesting point you make. It's It should be obvious. And the ironic thing about that is that, you know, in our day-to-day -day experience of whether it be uh, in some sporting teams or maybe even in the business world, it's not always the case because uh, in many ways, society has taught us that it's about this hard exterior that we need to show that is ultimately going to uh, advance into the result that you're looking for. But we've certainly learned in our experiences, uh, and my reference is only cricket. Uh, you've had um, a few different experiences in the business world as well as other sporting codes. But I can categorically say that in my own personal experience, when I felt a sense of belonging, when I felt a sense of love and appreciation for who I am and the uniqueness that I bring to the team, that was when I felt comfortable. And, and it's not always about just being comfortable. I think it's about giving you the best opportunity to perform. And once, particularly the leaders in the environment, when they understand that mechanism and understand that this is what they're trying to promote, you feel safe. You feel trusted. You feel in a place where you really can express yourself without being judged. I, I came across this, and this is probably in the last five years of my career. And somebody told me, you know, when, when I think of the, the cricketing context, I think about this new notion and idea of playing with freedom and expressing yourself. Now, I mean, the, and I'm sure you can contextualize that in a business sense as well. This, this idea of playing with freedom gets thrown around a lot. Mm -hmm. and go and express yourself but then unfortunately where things don't go according to plan there's a default setting that's that that kind of sets in and all of a sudden you get reprimanded for the outcome right but somebody shared this with me freedom is not freedom until it's freedom to fail and that yeah. was such a freeing experience mm -hmm. and freeing time in my in my cricketing career where i could really just release the outcome release the result and say, you're right, let's me focus on the process. And if I get uh, predominantly the process right, I give myself the best chance. And that was where I probably in the last five years enjoyed myself the most in my, my playing career. And obviously linking with you and speaking on various things in the team from a cultural perspective. And once I took the focus off just my performance, I took the focus off just how am I impacting this team, but how can I best serve my players? How can I best serve my teammates, my environment? And, you know, you speak about the idea of Ubuntu in, in your book and, and particularly in chapter three, where you speak a little bit about your experience of, of the Proteas. And, you know, we defined it in a way that it's the measure of our lives in how we, the, in how we impact other people. And in essence, what that means for me is how do we serve other people? And, I, I truly feel that the last couple of years of my career, I truly got it. I truly understood what that meant. Now, that, that, that did not get to a point of me or the team achieving the ultimate goal, which was obviously winning a World Cup. But the experience of it was second to none. And that's something that I will hold dearly. And, and I'm sure your experience in itself was something very similar being part of that team, would you say? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're raising some awesome points here. Uh, let's go back a step from Ubuntu. Let's come back to that. But in terms of well-being, a way that I think about well-being is that if people are well, they have high energy. And actually, it's impossible to perform at your best without energy. So I equate well-being with energy. And I'll give, I'll give an example to the audience. As you know, I would, I would come in for the occasional camp where we would have a culture camp. We did a few of those. But I would also come in at the start of each series pretty much so if you're playing australia 
I'd come in for that week in, of preparation before the first test. Um, and, you know, I would I did that over a period of how many years. And I would come into the camp and I would, and I would, you were obviously someone I was very close to. But when I came into the camp, I would always be able to see clearly your energy. Mm. Now, there were times where your energy was compromised because you have had an injury. So there was a physical well-being was being compromised and I could see and it affected your energy. Um, but there are other times when there was a social issue was affecting your energy. So, for example, there were some play conflict between some players and it hadn't been resolved. The type of person you are, the type of sensitive sensitivity you have, that would affect you. That would bring you down. Um, there would be times where you might have spiritually not well for whatever reason. Mm. Things might be going mm. on in your life. So that's an example where from a performance point of view, as I'm going into that environment, and you're a critical player, very understated, but you're a critical leader in that team for a long time. Um, and people may not appreciate that, but you're always one of like the three main leaders of that team. Hmm. Um, so your energy really had a big effect. And you were the, probably the one who was closest to the junior players. So as I come into an environment, I see your energy. And then you and I would go away, wouldn't we? We'd go and have our coffees and we would have our chats. And then I was part of my job as a culture coach was to try to understand what was affecting your energy. And as you say, if you had a certain style of coaching or whatever, which was telling, you know, which was putting a lot of fear of making mistakes on you, mm. then that would affect your state and that would affect your energy and your well-being. Mm. Whilst towards the end of your career, under Otis, and, and, and for example, you, know, you had more freedom. To express mm. yourself so i think it's you know it's useful to think about culture in terms of the energy people bring and if and if the energy of a group is suppressed or compromised we really need to understand why that is um, and often is the behavior of the leader can't get around mm. that just in terms of ubuntu um yes so that was a really powerful thing that i go into quite a lot of detail in chapter three about and the team before 2010 had got to world number one three times in a decade but had lost that ranking within a month or so each time. So you had the talent to be the best team in the world, but for whatever reason, you couldn't sustain it. And that's when I was brought in by, by Doc Musaji and, and, and Graham Smith and Jeremy Snape. And what was clear was that your goal was to win a World Cup and to be world number one. Mm. But that, that's a goal. That's an objective. It's not a purpose. What you didn't have was a joined up purpose with each other, which was what it meant to represent South Africa. And that's where Ubuntu came in, is that all of you signed up to this idea that the ultimate purpose of this team and the way you'll be measured is your impact on other people. And if you remember, we went to that Hennips River Primary School and yeah. those kids, which really covered the diversity of South Africa, this classroom, just you guys sat in the chairs in the classroom and shut up and listened to these 12-year-olds. And they said, what we think it is to be a South African is what we see when we watch you. And how you are different cultures and religions, but your brothers, you don't care who's the hero today. You just are there for each other. Um, and that's the way we want to be as a nation. You know, it was a beautiful picture of inclusion is, is what they spoke about. And that became your purpose. So, no, the team has not yet won the World Cup. Yeah, It will. And you won't be in it. You might be in this. Maybe you may coach the team, but you won't be playing in it. But, but to me, that's not failure. The failure is whether you have inspired and unified the South yeah. Africans. And, you know, you've done that many, many times in your career and you should be proud of that. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think about, uh, I get asked this question many times, do I miss playing the game? And I certainly don't. I mean, I, I can easily say that I don't miss playing the game because I think my... My opportunities that have been presented, uh, I'm very grateful for it, for the number of games that I've played and so forth. But then I was thinking while I was preparing for this conversation, I thought, but what, so what is it that I actually miss? I miss my teammates. Mm -hmm. I miss being part of a greater purpose. And I'm not saying that, that, that I don't have that now in my life. There's different aspects of my life that brings uh, that same sort of uh, belonging feeling. But it, it was such a huge part of my journey uh, in my life. Uh, and that was something that I hold very dear. You know, you, you speak a little bit about Hashim Amla as well. And, you know, we, we touch base from time to time and over a phone call. And 
it is just pure banter, you know, just a, a catch up of, of understanding of great brotherhood of that. We went through many wars together, many challenges where we probably didn't have many answers to, but the beauty of the respect and integrity in the relationship is something that I'll hold dear. And can I jump in on that? Just jump on yeah, that. Yeah, please. I'm so, please. And I'm so pleased you've mentioned this, but also men, mentioned hash. Because um, first of all, when I'm ever I'm working with a team and we define what our success is, it's not just a trophy. The success also should include that this is a great life experience for us. Mm. And, and that our relations, relationships are sustained beyond this experience. So what you're talking about isn't a nice thing or what it's it's success. That is part of success for me. Now I'll give you I'm pleased you mentioned that. Because I I, I think it was at the Wanderers, it was Hash's hundredth test match. Okay. Now the special ended yeah. up becoming a special day for both of you. But what I remember, and this is because I would come in and I got to know you guys, and like you, I keep in touch with Hash and Mornay mm -hmm. and Faf and a lot of the guys and AB and all the rest of it, you know, those it sustained ourselves beyond actually working together. But what I remember, and I actually took a photo of this, which I'd love to put on the screen here, was it was a day before Hash's 100th test match. And he had not been playing well for quite a few series. He was not in good form. And what I remember was you guys had a net beside each other. And then after the net, everybody sort of packs up and goes into the dressing room and stuff. But you guys had a chat as you finished your net. You just had a chat with each other. And I was hanging around. I just thought... And then I turned around about 10 minutes later and you were still chatting with each other. And you guys have known each other for like 10, 12 years, but you were chatting with each other like you just met. I, I, and I actually took this photo of you and him just looking at each other's eyes having this conversation. And do you know what happened the next day? You do. I'll remind yeah. everybody. On Hash's 100th test match, you and him batted together and you both scored hundreds and you were together when he scored his century. And there's an iconic photo of you and him hugging. And those are the two things that go together for me. You and him talking to each other with this beautiful love and connection and respect on one side of the image and the other side of the image is hugging each other, which was what the public sees. And to me, that captured the proteophile culture is that the success doesn't come without that first piece. Mm. No, it's a, it's a beautiful memory and certainly one that, yeah, that I'll hold dear for, for many years to come. Uh, I just want to kind of go slightly off, off course um, in terms of my question and it was particularly something that that you wrote about and it was a reference to professor robert uh, sapolsky yeah. and it was out of a reference of his book called behave and he speaks about uh, collectivist society and individualistic society and I just wanted wanted to know if you'd, you'd speak a little bit more into that and, and sort of the ideas and, and understanding around the two differences there. Mm. Well, and I think it's really important in a South African context to understand this. Mm. So it might sound a little bit simplistic, but Robert Sapolsky is the head of neuroscience at Stanford University, and he explains it very, very well. Is that you can look at the world at the moment in some ways as, as, as two worlds. There's the sort of... Western hyper capitalist societies, um, United States being the, probably the best example, which are highly individualistic. So it is, it's about the individual. So what's your purpose and what are your values and what are you going to achieve and what's success for you? And it's all about me, me, me. And so I go into the world as an individualist and I'm trying to do the best I can for myself. So the other sort of Western democratic um, capitalist societies, and you know, I live in one here in the United Kingdom, and I come from one in New Zealand and Australia, et cetera. But there's also another world, which is actually there's more people, which are more traditional societies, more collectivist. And that is the way they are brought up, the culture values putting the family and the tribe before any, any individual. So if we think about Asian societies are very much like that. African societies, um, certainly Polynesian societies. I'm part Maori myself and part European. So I have both sides to it. And in the Western society, in the, sorry, in the collectivist societies, it is all about each other. And it's not about me. 
And I, in my book, I, I mentioned I interviewed Jerome Kaino, the you know, uh, fantastic All Black player, mm. and I and he's part Samoan, well, fully some of a Samoan Kiwi. And I asked him, I said, "What's your personal sense of purpose and mission?" And he said, "That question doesn't make any sense to me. My purpose and mission is is my family. It's my tribe. It's whatever team I'm associated with." So I, I think people really don't quite understand this. And, and when you throw different people in together, they have a different way of thinking about the team. Some people are just so committed to the team thing because they come from a collectivist background. Well, a lot, other people, more individualists, are actually can be very, very selfish. You can see this in American sport. They don't mind disrupting the team if they want to get more money or more celebrity or whatever. They're prepared to do that because it's all about me, what I can get out of this experience. So I think it takes really good leadership, and including the proteas, where you have people coming from sort of different ways of thinking about the world and themselves, and you've actually got to try and you know weave it together. That takes skilled leadership to do that, because people have got very different mindsets about what it means to be in a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about the leadership element that you're referring to there, and we can speak into yes, uh, you know, the proteas and 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 the sort of diverse cultures that we had to uh, navigate our way through. And I get this, this, this image and the sense of a round table and everybody having an equal footing at that table, no matter what background you come from, cultural difference, uh, ethnic difference, you come to the table and your story means something. Mm -hmm. And I think from a, from a leadership perspective, and I think about potential leaders on the call and potentially having these kind of challenges brought their way, trying to navigate their way through, uh, you know, diversity coming into the table, into the pot as a conversation. And, and often as a leader, you feel that you need to have the answers. But I've certainly found that it's not necessarily about having the answers. It's about allowing everybody at that table to have an equal footing and a voice. And, and that's where we start this, this understanding of the diversity that we possess as a South African uh, nation being utilized as a strength. And I certainly feel uh, as a collective, you know, in our country, I still don't think that we've truly grasped the fact of how this diversity can truly become an asset for us. Would you agree? I do. And if we're going to talk about good leadership, then I really have to mention Faf Duplessis because I've, I've worked across a lot of different sports um, you know, at, at, at a high level and with business leaders, as you know, and, and other spheres, including the military. I'm not joking. I don't think I've come across a better leader than Faf. Mm. I think he's an absolutely outstanding leader. And I'll, I'll give an example which touches this point you've made, is that he was always concerned as captain of the Proteus that the team was set up and the culture was reflective of himself, you know, heavily influenced by himself, who was an Africana. And he was very, very clear minded that we needed an environment where everyone felt equal and everybody felt respected. And if we just bring in like an Africana way of doing things, then that could actually not be an inclusive environment for even you or, or Hash or you know, any of the guys who aren't Afrikaners mm. might not feel comfortable in that environment. Mm. He was always incredibly concerned about it. So it's an example of his excellent leadership is that, as you will recall, he used to go around the team, including the junior players, players from the diversity of the team, and ask them, how do you find the experience here? Tell me. Are we doing things in a way that makes it hard for you to be yourself? Hard, hard for you to thrive and that's a pretty simple question but that's a friggin' awesome question for a leader to ask people is that going around the diversity and just saying is this a is this a place where you can be yourself is this a place where you feel respected is this a place where and he would ask them he would ask the guys what would you change if you were me mm. how do we do things differently and he would ask he got to kg wouldn't he mm. timber all the guys would ask everybody just tell me. And he'd get frustrated if people say, no, no, it's cool. We're happy. It's all good. And no, it's not. It's not the answer I want. I know we've got to evolve this. 
So that is awesome leadership. And you're also right around, in my book, I also explain some of the, some of the science around humans thrive when hierarchy gets flattened. And I know, you know, it's part of all of our backgrounds is quite hierarchical societies. Okay, and often that's replicated in a sports team where you've got your coach and the manager and then the captain and then the senior players and it goes down like that. But I think it's really important to understand. I think actually this generation now really, really live this. They don't want to be plugged into a hierarchy. They want to have a voice now and they want to be respected. And so we've got to make a shift here. And I mean, that example from FAF was, was very enlightened, but I think that's a direction that people need to follow. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've had the privilege of, I mean, we we are pretty much best friends and, and seeing the transition for him in leadership has been second to none. Um, so I, I certainly agree that he's certainly been uh, an inspiration to me and, and many others. And then I, th- then I think about, let's, let's, let's sort of invert the commas, call it challenging characters in an environment. And I link back to your mm-hmm. early statement yeah. Um, around speaking about energy. And I'm sure people have heard the term energy sappers, energy givers. <clears throat> in your experience in different environments, how have you uh, encouraged the leaders? Because I, I know you're not directly dealing with those characters possibly. How have you encouraged leaders to deal or uh, just navigate their way through, through those difficult situations? Well, firstly, we just have to have some standards that we all sign up to. There's no getting around that. And some people can be difficult personalities. I mean, that's a bit, I don't really like that language, but, but they, you know, they can still meet the standards of like how you, how we address each other, how we speak with each other, um, those type of things. So I think standards is a starting point. If people won't live our standards, then we have to have, um, a serious think about whether they can stay in the team. I mean, you know, I, I, there's only one rule I really have around the work I do, and that is I'm pretty relaxed about a lot of things as long as the team comes first for every individual. If they mm-hmm. will do that, I reckon we can work from there. Um, yeah. But if, if they don't believe that, or they believe they come first before the team, then I, I, I normally would struggle to see how that would work out. But coming back to your question about difficult personalities, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this back on you, my friend. Because a lot of that difficult personalities is actually just the fact we don't understand our people around us well enough. Now, you remember in Hennep's River, we started a ritual, which went through the whole 10 years that I was involved with the Pro Tears, and hopefully is still alive now. And, and the last time I ever attended it, 2019, you were the MC of it. And that is any new players who came into the environment, we would sit them on the bar stools in front of the rest of the team. And I remember that, you know, you were absolutely amazing at this. You would say to them, congratulations on becoming a pro to you. You belong here. You have earned the right to be here. Whatever you do in your first game, we will not judge you. Mm. You're, you're, you're someone who will contribute and you will contribute when you're ready. And it was an, an amazing message of belonging to send to people. But we, this is a ritual that started 10 years ago. But we had three questions, didn't we? Which was, where did you grow up? Where did you first play cricket? And what does it mean to others that you're a pro to you? And those questions, you know, it was beautiful for me. The last camp I ever went to in Port Elizabeth, um, we were still asking the same questions and, and get, of these rookies than we did 10 years before. And that's a sign of a strong culture. But why that is important is the very, very first time we did that in Hennep's River, I remember... And Graham Smith went and he, you know, Graham, I grew up here and I went play cricket here. And, you know, I think it was at quite a good, nice private school and good coaching and all the rest of it. And that was great. And then the person that went after him said, um, well, I grew up in this township. I actually didn't play cricket between the ages of, I think, 11 and 15. Mm. And then I think Bob Skinstad actually, remember, he came with me that day and we, he was doing the MCing the very first time we did it. And he said, well, well, well why didn't you play cricket? And they said, because in our township, the gangs bet on the games. And they kept telling me what to do in these games on the street. And I wouldn't do what they told me. And then one day they came to our, my family's house and, mm. and locked the doors and told my parents that if I didn't obey them next time, they would burn the house down. 
And my mm. mother said to me, you're never to play cricket again. And then the person went on to say, I know some of you people think I'm a bit difficult and a bit introverted, but you can't judge me unless you know this story. Now, yeah. because we had a ritual of belonging, we, everybody got up to speed with that story and his slight personality quirks around it that he pulled out himself. Mm. And he wasn't regarded as difficult. He was just regarded as having his own story. Yeah. And we could empathize with why he might, you know, be reticent and not trusting people as quickly as others do and all that, because he's had some harsh experiences. So for me, that was that was is huge. It's a difficult character. Let's just not do the difficult bit. Let's just not judge people until we get to know them properly. And if and and, and if we believe in diversity, we should believe in diversity of personality as well, I think. Mm. Yeah. You, you you remind me of uh, a, a, as a leader, I think about, you know, you can have somewhat of a difficult, uh, let's say, let's call it a difficult character in a situation, re referencing what you're referring to now. And, and I'm thinking about, we can then ostracize them in the sense of what we need to kick them out because they're not lining up what you referred to as standards, right? So you want you want your organization or your team or just people in an environment to line up to those standards because ultimately it's more likely that the environment sets, sets that standards. But yeah. when they sort of go, of course, I'm always aware that the first point of call is not to kick out, but to ask the question, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. What's up with you? What's happening in your world? Let me come and sit in your world before I judge your world. And it, it, it links back to what you're referring to, isn't it? And I've certainly found myself guilty of this at times because you get overwhelmed by emotion. I remember fondly, and it wasn't actually a, a, a Proteus game. It was back in uh, for, the, for the Cape Cobras, and I was captain at the time. And there was a character in there. There was a play in there that I just found just challenging the environment all the time. And I thought to myself, right, after this practice session, I'm going to go to him and I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. And I actually spoke to the performance coach, the culture coach at that, that point in time. And I mentioned to him what I was going to do. And he just looked at me and he said, maybe you should consider asking him what's happening for him. Beautiful. And I did. And I did that. And all of a sudden, I'd realized that he was battling with this transition of not being selected previously being a sort of first, uh, first in the team sheet kind of scenario. And he was struggling to navigate his way through it. And all of a sudden we're having this conversation about it. And the next thing, you know, he's all in again and mm -hmm. buying and, and, and living up to the standards. So it's, it's certainly a, a f fascinating story um, and, and journey that, that we've, we've lived as a, as a protest and a cricketing culture. Well, I'm, I'm can, aware of the, yeah, yeah carry on. No, just on this one, I think, I mean, this raises also for me is I still feel the best frame for being a great leader and a great coach is parenting. And right. one of the, and I do, and I'm not shy about saying that. Um, not everybody's a parent, so it's not a reference point for everybody. But when, when, you, when one of your kids is being difficult, which they <laughs> pretty common, you don't have a reflex that you get rid of them. Mm. But yet in these workplaces and environments we have this reflex that if something you know we don't like or they aren't or they're difficult let's get rid of them i think it's a really flawed way to approach it and i'll, I'll give you an example uh, last a couple of months ago a football coach here was chatting to me and they were having a very difficult time and there's a few players that he was really annoyed with felt like they'd, they'd lost um their attention and their effort and he gave me a, and he, he called me and he, he wanted to give them a real, quite, in a team meeting, really, I'd, I'd target them. Mm. And, and at the end of the conversation, I, I just, he said, what do you think? And I just said, can I just ask you a question? If, if any of those were your children, how would they respond mm. to that conversation? And he said, it would probably destroy them. It, it, mm. would, it would demotivate them. It would shame them in front of their peers. It would probably be a disaster. I said, why, 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 what's the difference? That's someone else's kids. Mm. And in some reason, in these sort of working environments, we tend to have a different model completely about how to get the best out of people or how to address 
challenging situations. And often the reflex is let's get rid of them. And I think that's incredibly unhelpful. And I think the skill of great leaders is they actually can make, like Alex Ferguson is able to actually retain big characters rather than difficult characters, mm. you know, rather than the coach who just gets rid of them all to get people who are sort of clones of each other. So yeah, to me, it's an absolute last resort. Also, if you get rid of somebody, you sack somebody or you, or you deselect somebody, it can have an effect on the rest of their lives, yeah. you know? And, and, and it's not a culture of belonging. It's the opposite if our default yeah. is to reject people. So to me, it's an absolute last resort and it should be about the standards rather than their personality. Yeah, well said on. Uh, I just thought maybe it'd be an opportune time uh, to look at if there are any questions that have been posed in the chat box. Uh, and if you maybe want to come in here and just see if there's anything that you want to pose to any one of us. Cool. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, JP and Owen. I mean, I think just to reflect something back, you know, it's been a deep privilege to hear you to talk about these this, this very important very important things and very personally and so thank you for that i feel very lucky mm. to be on the uh, here and, and live uh, with you um i'd go to the first question um and it and it links with the diversity of of south africa and uh, and around how do you create true belonging in a very diverse context and, uh, and where there may be woundedness and and very different histories and um, I'm wondering, Owen, if you could you could speak to that uh, um, as you know, in, and maybe there's some experience from the, your South African time or around the world. Mm. Well, um, mm. when we've got a diver diverse group of people, we can uh, that that's an that's a credit that's a competitive advantage potentially if we are smart enough to make the use of it. So the first thing we have to do is create a shared identity of who this group is. Um, if we all just look at each other as individuals, then we're probably going to look at each other's differences. So the leaders have to proactively create a sense of this is this team or organization, and we have our own identity, and all of us form part of it. And with the South African cricket team, for example, we did one exercise, JP, in Sri Lanka, I remember, on the beach, where we actually went back 100 years in South African cricket history, and we used these big circles to explain the... Proteas, the team before the Proteas with the Springboks, which was a white only team. And we drew a big circle and we stood around the circle and we actually listened to the story of, of, of why that was. Because some of the guys were born after apartheid ended, for example. Then we drew another circle, which was actually, you know, the what I think was called the Coloreds team, um, who had their own cricket union and own national team. And we actually got people to talk about what that team was and, and, and how cricket for that part of the community worked. And then we drew another circle, which was around black cricket and how they had their own national team and how these, so these three circles, but then what we did is we all had this massive circle that we'd drawn in the sand as well. And we all stood there around these other circles and then moved together around this circle, which was the proteas. And it was quite, it's quite a graphic way for the leaders to say that, Yes, we've got a difficult past and a past which isn't inclusive and a past which has a lot of pain in it. But actually this circle of our identity now is different. And when everyone stood in there around that circle, I think everyone had a completely different perspective on what it was to be a protea. But they needed to understand the history and heritage that shaped it. So to me, that shared, shared identity, you've got to do hard work around that. And then the second thing which binds the diverse people together is a shared vision. Because no matter what's happened in the past, if we are going to work together, we're going to be doing, we're walking towards that vision together. So I think if there's a really compelling vision um, that is painted for us and we feel part of, that is also something that binds diverse groups together. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, uh, Owen. I've got a, an, another question. Uh, which there've been a couple of questions before the session and then online about working with um, in a context in which maybe the, the, the shared identity is not as strong as a national team environment and where each person might have very particular individual goals. And, and so you've spoken a bit about that, but could you just elaborate a little bit uh, for our audience about where, where, where very strong individual goals or maybe appropriate people are building their careers 
and and how you work to bring them together. Yeah, well, I actually have done some work with Investec in the UK, obviously a South African based bank. And they asked the same question, like we're not a national sports team. So how do we create this sort of sense of shared identity um, that is bigger than individuals? Because everyone's there motivated, but they're motivated to be well remunerated and they're mm -hmm. motivated for career progress. So how do we create something? And part of it is definitely storytelling. Because what had happened was that the story of Investec, which is pretty cool, had got lost along the way as it become more bureaucratized and grown over the decades. And the actual story, and for businesses, the origin story is pretty powerful often. But the Investec one had been lost. And I actually had the privilege of speaking to some of the um, founders of the bank as part of my piece of work. And it was actually incredibly cool. In these suburbs of Johannesburg, these guys wanted basically to allow their neighbors dentists, lawyers, et cetera, to be able to upgrade their car and, 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 and just basically improve their lifestyle. And the banks weren't cooperating. So they actually set up this financing little business, which helped them. And then the, and then the Central Bank of South Africa wrote them a letter and said, we know what you're doing. It's illegal. The only people who can do that is a bank. If you continue to do it, we'll prosecute you. So these guys sitting at basically in a living room then wrote to the 14 banks in South Africa and said, can anyone, um, is anyone interested in selling us a license? And um, one of them came back and said, actually, we're looking to get out of this. So yeah, you can have ours. So they became a bank by accident. And what's interesting is today, they've always talked about themselves as the outsider, you know, and they like that positioning. If you actually understand their identity story, that's authentic, isn't it? Because they were outside, didn't want to be a bank. They just wanted to help people, help their neighbors and help their friends. So I think there's a lot of stuff that can be done if you look. And when I work with startups, for example, we really curate an origin story that is going to be empowering culturally going forth. You know, we have clear values, we have a clear purpose, a really good vision, all that, do that really, really well at the start and actually provide, provides a good environment for people who come after. Thanks very much. Um, Owen, maybe I'd turn it, I'd be a little bit... Uh, an orthodox and turn it to you, JP. But I mean, you've been through these experiences, uh, and 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 what would you what would you share as a like appreciatively like what really worked to to bring people together uh, to to help people feel like they belonged? I mean, you you had many different uh, um, culture coaches and, and experiences. And what's what's been some of what what you could share? Yeah, and it's very much what Owen is speaking about and very similar experiences that you just feel a sense that your story matters and where you come from matters and that nobody uh, from whichever background you're from or from, each, from whichever sort of ethnic background you're from, that no matter what you say, it's important. And I found that when we connect as a team is when we allow each other the opportunity to, to share. And it's not always an easy process because guys, certain guys would have gone through challenging experiences uh, in the upbringing, as Owen mentioned a little bit earlier, but allowing that authenticity to come out, allowing whichever way that comes out, let it come out and appreciate that because you possibly will have somebody that couldn't possibly speak English properly. So now the communication barrier is a bit of a challenge, but if you can truly look past all that and truly look to him as, as your teammate and say, you know what, we are going to be going through difficult times together. And for us to really come out uh, the other side and having achieved some sort of success, whichever way that looks, I want to be able to know that I can rely on you. But how do I be able to know, how do I get to a point to be able to rely on you? Because if I know you through in and throughout. And that has been truly the most remarkable experience. And that's why I talk about earlier, what do I miss most? I miss, you know, these culture moments where, where we get to know each other on a deeper level that truly just connects us uh, spiritually, emotionally. Uh, so I, I truly miss those moments. <laughs> Thanks, JP. I'll, I'll hand it back to you. I don't know if uh, you've, we've got another uh, eight minutes or so. Is there... You know, there are a couple of questions I can keep going, but uh, do you want me yeah. to, or do you do you have no, anything no, on your I, side? I, I, I'm looking at there were there were a few questions that were were sent through previously, uh, and and there was actually one that really stood out, Owen, and, and I thought I'll throw this to you, 
And the question was, how do you rebuild trust where there has been some kind of injury where you're being mistrusted, where it is really not warranted? Mm. Well, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting one. So I think it's something that um, you and I can both re- you know, talk about a little bit is in Fairway in 2016, the Proteas had a second big culture camp. And I think I think that's really important. And I obviously go into a bit of detail in the in belonging around this because you know we had something powerful in 2010, but then it, the culture drifted. So the, you guys were world number one for pretty much four years. You you really wanted to win that 2015 World Cup. Um, got to the semi final and then lost in the last over and hell of a difficult circumstances. Um, and what but what happened was everyone was so gutted mm. that. The motivation was affected and actually the culture drifted a little bit for a while, didn't it? And the team went actually yeah. from world number one to world number seven. And then we called the culture camp in Fairway. Um, and that was a really powerful camp. And then, as I say in the book, within six months, you got back to world number one, which showed how much your culture was critical and correlated to your performance. When the culture was, was in Faf's words, not healthy, then the performances would dip off badly. So just to answer the question, though, I remember in that situation when we got back together in Fairway, one of the issues in the team had been a breach of trust in some ways around the selection for the World Cup semi-final, if you recall. Um, Kyle Abbott had been playing amazing cricket. And then for the semi-final, Vernon Philander was brought in to replace him, even though Vernon had been injured. So there was a lot of talk around whether or not it was political or cricket or whatever. And I still actually don't know the truth of exactly what happened. It's not really relevant. But what was relevant was that even the talk around the team had affected the trust Mm. and relationships, not just between Kyle and Vern, who didn't fall out, but it obviously created some some issues. And within the wider team as well, there were some who thought Vern should have played and shouldn't have played. And it was just a tricky issue which did affect the trust in the environment trust in the coaches and probably trust in each other so what we did at fairway exactly as you explained before is we all got in a circle right i got some beautiful photos of this as well i should send some to you because it was you know powerful got in a circle and then the leaders who were a b and faf um in particular russell domingo was coach and then you and hash as key senior leaders we said, we do, you know, my job was to facilitate that, is to what are the things we need to talk about today? And quite quickly was we have not healed from that loss. Okay, I understand. Is it, is it just disappointment and not making the final or maybe winning? Or is there something else? No, it's something else as well. What's that? Just the circumstances around that. So if you recall, what we did is we got it out there. We created a space, which leaders must do. Just create the time and space for this issue to come out. And then we don't, we hold back all judgment. The leader doesn't introduce it by saying you're right, you're wrong, or you've done something bad. None of that. We just ear out what is the issue. And then if you remember, we got Vern just to give his version of it. And not not just version, but actually explain how it felt for him to be part of this, which he had no control over. And then we got Kyle to do the same thing. And it wasn't anyone defending themselves because it wasn't their fault, but they were just explaining. And what they found was that they're a bit at crossroads because they hadn't actually had a conversation around it, they weren't on the same page on this issue. And I know, and, and it ended up them giving each other a hug and it allowed the team to move on from this issue. So to answer your question, if there's been a breakdown in trust, we need to create time and space to address it. In a non-judgmental way, we need to identify the issue that's holding us all back. And then we need to give the people who are involved an opportunity just to speak about it, not defend themselves or justify themselves, just speak about it and how they feel. And from that, in my experience, we get really productive conversations and we get some resolution. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the term, you know, when we're listening to somebody speak, are we listening to respond or are we actually listening to you? Beautiful, man. Beautiful. And, and, you know, it's been so critical in my growth as sort of operating in, in culture spaces and team environments is... I've got to be conscious of that because our wiring sometimes is we want to defend ourselves. We want to defend, well, that's not right. This is what it was. And, and, and I often even see it in relationships at home. 
you know, wife, kids, you want to defend. And, you know, something that I've become conscious of is allowing myself to ask the question, do you mind if I respond? Or what would you like from me in this moment? Mm. Um, which has been so powerful in terms of growing in, in relationships. I think one thing, I'll, you know, before we finish up, I want to say to you as my friend, the thing I'm really proud of you um, in area of growth from us having worked over those 10 years is your awareness of how your en energy affects people. I remember early on, if you weren't playing well, your form wasn't great, you would get a bit quiet. Um, but by the end of your career, you were so solid and consistent because you knew that if you, even if you weren't playing at your best, you knew that that energy from you mm. was affecting people around you and then even affect their confidence. But that when, if you were rock solid every day, it mm. created an incredible energy to those people around you who look up to you. And that, that, you know, that's, part of it. that's part of success, my friend. It's not just your statistics and the trophies that you got. It's your growth as a person. And I think just on that token as well, you know, me and you are great friends with Mornay Morkel. And I still have that mm. image in my mind of him leaning over one day to get into his locker while mm. Hash and some of the other guys were praying at midday in the dressing room. And no one even thought twice about any of it. You know, mm. coming from all these different backgrounds and environments where that would is very foreign, that, you know, that type of thing. Actually, they got, you, you became brothers in a family and actually, it wasn't mm. even anything that you even noticed if you had to lean over the guys yeah. who were praying to get something out of your locker. And they thought likewise. And, and that, is, that is amazing. And that's success because that changes you as a person and makes you a better person back into the community. Mm. Yeah, thanks, so. Uh Anthony, I, I'm just wondering if there are any last minute questions or anything or comments. Um. Thanks, JP. Yeah, look, there's there's plenty. It's been a very uh, <laughs> vibrant uh, chat, and so so many questions that we we haven't had time for. Um, and so I'd rather turn it back to you. And and uh, you know maybe I'd and so maybe I'd I'll um, I'll just invite the two of you to close off, and then I can just share a little bit, kind of you know, two, you know, one minute summary. So anything you'd like to close off with, uh, uh, JP or, or I. Yeah, just, uh, oh man, it's been, it's been emotional and powerful to reflect on firstly reading parts of, of Owen's book and, and just kind of remembering and, and thinking back to uh, those experiences and how powerful of an impact that has been, particularly in my life and how those cultural values and experiences will carry forward for, for many years to come, God willing, that I'm you know, seen as an influencer in, in this world. Um, yeah, it's been powerful to, to reflect, Owen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to have this conversation with you. And, you know, we, w the first words that came out of your mouth today was, I love you, my brother. And that was like setting the tone of this conversation. So I just want to throw that back to you and say I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, JP. Thanks. Oh, Owen. Wonderful. Well, look, my final... Thanks so much. This has been very special and I really appreciate um, Anthony, everything you guys have done and to have JP and, and me spend this time together is also emotional yeah. and, and makes me feel proud. Uh, I, you know, my final point would be, and this goes to the heart of belonging, is that let's all just have massive awareness about how our environment affects us. And that means that we, what a leader is, is someone who has that intention that I want this environment that I'm part of to uplift the people around me. And I can't do that if I'm selfish and if I'm not kind. So if we just start from that point that people around us will thrive in a good environment and I've got a responsibility to do whatever I can to create that. And that to me is a starting point of a great leader. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Owen. I've, I've personally taken so much. I've been taking notes in the background here just for myself and and so it's been a, a huge gift. Um, and I know that if I'm feeling it, many, many other people out there are, are, are too and are going to uh, watch this and, and, and gain so much from this experience. And, and the fact that, you know, JP, you were able to really, with your open heart, kind of lean in to un unlocking some of the secrets of, of belonging, of performance, of connectedness, mm. um, I think has made this a, a fantastic session. So just big thank you to you, JP, for 
for joining us at, at Gibbs uh, for this Flash Forum and uh, and bringing your experience and wisdom uh, because I couldn't have couldn't have it wouldn't have been the same if uh, if I'd interviewed Owen I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Anthony. Nearly, Appreciate you. Would, would not have nearly been as as good as it as it has been. Uh, and uh, and I think you've answered my question. Um, some of the questions online, Owen, in your closing comments there, which, you know, many different questions, but I think if, if we go back to the idea of, of kindness, of selflessness, and of nurturing the environment, you know, then whether there's some questions about it, how do we do this online? Well, think about the online environment. You know, how do we do this where players are, there's a lot of change in the team, you know, we'll think about how, how the environment is, is shaped as people come in and, and leave and come in and leave. And so, paying attention to that environment and paying attention to that context where, as you say, 70% of uh, the source of our behaviors lies. Um, there's a lovely thought to whatever we're encountering. How do we shape that environment? So yeah. thank you very much. We've run a few minutes over and uh, I really appreciate uh, you staying a little longer and on, on, the, on, the, on the session. And thanks to everybody who joined us on behalf of Gibbs. Thanks, uh, guys. Wish you well. And of course, you can buy Owen's book. So let's not forget to punt that. We've dropped, maybe JD, you can just Drop the link in there again, um, and uh, and of course uh, it's uh, it's it's a it's a great book and it's um, it's available. So uh, please go out and uh, and get it. Uh, thanks very much, JP. Thanks very much, Owen. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take Bye, care. Everybody. Take care.